In the opening years of World War II, more than 690 American pilots died, not in battle, but in catastrophic accidents while flying the revolutionary F-4U Corsair. Hailed as the first US fighter to break 400 miles per hour, the Corsair promised speed few could match. Yet its 2,000 horsepower engine and enormous 13-foot propeller turned carrier landings into a deadly gamble nicknamed the Ensign Eliminator. Why did such an advanced machine become a nightmare for the very rookies it was meant to protect? To understand why so many F4U Corsair pilots never made it home, we have to go back to the gamble that started it all. Ensigns fresh from flight school lined up for their first carrier landings, nerves stretched thin by the reputation that preceded the Corsair. Instructors called it the Ensign Eliminator, not as a joke, but as a warning. The numbers were impossible to ignore. Out of all Corsairs lost in World War II, nearly 700 were destroyed in non-combat accidents. Training logs from 1943 read like casualty reports. Another aircraft cartwheeled off the deck, another rookie failed to arrest, another family notified. The deck crew grew used to the shriek of metal and the sudden silence that followed. Letters home carried a different kind of fear. Young pilots wrote about flying blind on approach, trusting only the frantic gestures of men waving paddles at the edge of the deck. Some described the moment the left wing dropped without warning, the sudden roll, the helpless slide toward the sea. There was little comfort in experience. Most had only a handful of hours in the Corsair before being ordered to solo. No dual seat trainers existed. Every mistake played out at full speed with a 2000 horsepower engine and a wall of steel waiting if the landing went wrong. At Bronson Field and other practice strips, the pattern repeated, bounce, porpoise, crash. The accident board blamed pilot error, but the stories told a different truth. The Corsair demanded perfection from men who barely knew its limits. The cost was measured in shattered planes and lost futures, long before any enemy ever fired a shot. Rex Beisel and his Vought design team set out in 1938 to build a fighter that would shatter every speed record in the Navy's books. The centerpiece was the Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp a 2,000-horsepower radial engine, nearly twice as powerful as anything in frontline service. To turn all that power into thrust, the team selected a 13-foot propeller, the largest ever mounted on a single-engine fighter. That prop alone forced a radical rethink of the entire airframe. Traditional landing gear would have needed to be impossibly long and fragile. Instead, Beisel's team drew up the now-famous inverted gull wing, a shape that dipped downward from the fuselage before sweeping up at the tips. This let the landing gear stay short and strong while still clearing the massive prop on takeoff and landing. Wind tunnel tests at Stratford, Connecticut showed the gamble paid off. The prototype Corsair, first flown in 1940, blasted past 400 miles per hour, making it the fastest US Navy fighter ever tested. Test pilot Boone Guyton described the sensation as Utterly fantastic, a leap in performance that left even experienced pilots struggling to keep up. Everything about the Corsair was built for speed, flush rivets, tight skin, and a streamlined cowling that squeezed every last knot from the engine. But every advantage came with a cost. The long nose blocked forward vision and the powerful engine twisted the airframe on takeoff and landing. Design memos from the period show engineers wrestling with control quirks and warning that the Corsair would demand more from its pilots than any aircraft before it. In pursuit of raw speed, Vought had created a machine that was both a marvel and a menace, setting the stage for the hazards that would soon haunt its reputation. Landing a Corsair on a carrier deck was a test of nerve, coordination, and luck. The pilot's view forward was blocked by the long nose and raised engine cowling. At low speeds, the deck vanished beneath a wall of blue metal. On approach, the only guide was the landing signal officer, waving paddles at the edge of the ship. Pilots had to judge their descent by glimpses from the side, trusting hand signals over their own instincts. The margin for error was razor thin. The trouble didn't end with visibility. As the Corsair slowed, the aerodynamics turned unpredictable. The left wing, shielded from the full force of the propeller's slipstream, would sometimes stall first. Without warning, the aircraft could snap into a roll. Veteran test pilots described the sensation as a sudden drop and twist, one moment stable, the next sliding toward the waves. 
accident reports from 1942 and 1943 are filled with accounts of this asymmetric stall, often triggered in the final seconds before touchdown. Even a perfect approach could end in disaster. The Corsair's landing gear, built short and stiff to clear the massive propeller, had almost no give. If the wheels struck the deck at the wrong angle, the plane would bounce back into the air, pitching forward or skipping down the deck in a series of uncontrolled hops. This porpoising effect left pilots fighting for control, sometimes overshooting the arresting wires and crashing into the barrier, or worse, tumbling overboard. Deck crews and engineers watched each landing with tense anticipation, knowing that any misstep could be fatal. For every successful recovery, another Corsair was left battered at the edge of the flight deck, a testament to the dangers that came not from enemy fire, but from the machine itself. British test pilots, handed their first Corsairs in late 1943, confronted the same dangers that haunted American decks. Captain Eric Winkle Brown and his fleet air arm squadron saw the problem instantly. The straight-in approach left the carrier hidden behind the Corsair's nose until the last moment. Instead, they adopted a curved, almost semicircular path to the deck, keeping the ship in view out the side window as long as possible. This small change, borrowed from seafire routines, let pilots judge their descent by sight, not guesswork. The British also clipped eight inches from each wingtip to squeeze the Corsair into cramped hangars, a fix that had the side effect of taming its tendency to float on landing. These practical tweaks, along with a raised pilot seat and a bulged canopy, proved that the Corsair could operate from carriers if pilots were trained for its quirks. Meanwhile, American engineers chased a solution to the lethal asymmetric stall. Flight test logs from Patuxent River recorded the breakthrough. A six-inch metal stall strip, riveted to the starboard wing's leading edge just outboard of the guns, forced the right wing to stall first. Suddenly, the violent left roll on approach was gone. The fix was so effective that it became standard on all new Corsairs, with field teams working overtime to retrofit every older airframe still in service but technical fixes offered no shield against combat inexperience. On February 14, 1943, VMF-124, America's first Corsair squadron, flew escort over Bougainville. Within minutes, Japanese fighters tore through their loose formation. Radio confusion, cockpit unfamiliarity, and the urge to outturn zeros left Corsairs spiraling down in flames. Several pilots ditched or bailed out. Survivors described the chaos as a blur of tracer fire and missed warnings. The whistling death had lived up to its name, but on that day, it was the rookies who paid the price. Each loss forced a hard lesson. Mastery would come only through adaptation, not brute courage. Marine and Navy aces quickly learned to turn the Corsair's raw power into an edge. Instead of tight dogfights, they relied on boom and zoom tactics, high-speed dives, slashing attacks, and rapid climbs that left slower Japanese zeros behind. The Corsair's 6.50 caliber machine guns, later joined by 420mm cannons in some models, delivered overwhelming firepower in a single pass. Pilots like Kenneth Walsh and Gregory Pappy Boyington used these strengths to rack up victories, often breaking up enemy formations before they could react. As the war pressed on, ground crews loaded Corsairs with rockets and up to 2,000 pounds of bombs, transforming the fighter into a formidable strike aircraft. Combat reports from the Philippines and Okinawa described Corsairs sweeping the skies clean, then pounding enemy positions below. Proof of operational mastery forged through hard-won experience. In 1944, the U.S. Navy issued its long-awaited approval. The Corsair, now equipped with softer oleo struts, a raised pilot seat, and a bulged canopy, was cleared for full carrier service. These changes transformed the approach. Landings became less punishing, and pilots could finally catch a glimpse of the deck before committing to touchdown. Carrier air groups began to rearm with Corsairs just in time for the final Pacific campaigns. From the decks of Essex-class carriers at Okinawa and the Philippines, Corsair squadrons swept the skies and hammered targets below. By the war's end, the numbers told their own story. Official records credited the Corsair with destroying over 2,100 enemy aircraft at the cost of fewer than 200 air-to-air -air combat losses, a victory ratio of roughly 11 to 1. The machine that once threatened its own pilots now stood as the deadliest Allied fighter in the Pacific. 
Official Navy documents confirm that the Corsair's early design, its massive 13-foot propeller, inverted gull wing, and minimal forward visibility, made carrier landings especially deadly for inexperienced aviators. While British carrier tactics and American engineering fixes eventually tamed many of these hazards, the learning curve was steep. Still, the Corsair's transformation from the so-called Ensign Eliminator to a premier fighter bomber with an 11 to 1 kill ratio shows how institutional adaptation can overcome deadly flaws. Today, the Corsair stands as a reminder. Innovation in warfare demands both technical daring and a willingness to confront its human cost.